can't tell you now, it's not a good reason. It was our first row. Friday night, we got a bottle of cider, which I paid for, and we'd walked halfway around the reservoir looking at the stars and all those electronic winking things, satellites, radars, space probes. He's into all that. He was. He was talking about all the messages bouncing around up there, weather reports and top-secret military stuff and plane guidance systems and everyone's texts and phone calls and scientific data and radio waves and how amazing it is that none of it gets mixed up. He said, each message finds its home. It was good, but I was freezing. As we were walking back, he said, tomorrow night, let's go round to John's. I said, why can't we go clubbing? And he said, you know I haven't got any money. And I said, you can never afford to go anywhere proper. And he said, but my mum. And I said, I'm sick of your mum. I told him I was cold, so I was getting the bus. I knew he didn't have his bus fare, and I just got on the bus and left him behind. Then on Saturday night, I went to Sarah's. Her mum had had a clear out, and there was this heap of vintage clothes, so that's what I was doing. I was with Sarah, trying on her mum's old jacket and skirts, while Steve was doing that. And now I've got a Bieber top and a long skirt cut on the cross, black and grey panels, flared. Instead of Stevie, a skirt, instead of a boyfriend. It's not funny. And he didn't kill himself. It was an accident, accidental overdose. But what if it wasn't? What if they found out it couldn't have been an accident? Am I the one they'll question? We've only been going out two months. I didn't say we should split up or anything. I texted him from Sarah's while I was wearing that skirt. Soz and a smiley and see you tomorrow. Kiss, hug, kiss, hug. But I don't know if he got it. I don't know what time. He didn't do drugs. So it happened because of me. Whatever the weather, because if I'd been at John's with him, he wouldn't have. See? It's down to me. Right. And if a kid gets run over in the street, is it my fault? Because I should have been standing outside school making sure no one ever runs in the road. Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm responsible for everyone's health and safety. No way is it my fault. No way. I don't even know if he liked me. He probably went out with me because he couldn't get anyone better. <laughs> I was in a bad mood with him on Friday because I was cold. Now he's dead. Because I was cold. He's stone cold. <laughs> How on earth can someone who was alive be dead? I tried again this afternoon listening. I can't even remember what he looks like and I only saw him on Friday. I have to look on my phone to even remember his face. I tried to reach out in my mind like a laser probing the atmosphere to locate some trace of him, even just one word, instead of this demented traffic jam that's doing my head in. He's in it, isn't he? Stands to reason. He's got to be somewhere. Nothing vanishes. He's up there with all that stuff he likes. The radio waves and phone signals and satellites. I'm not a kid. It's not like I think he's got to be in the sky, like souls go to heaven kind of thing. But if a bit of you flies out of your body, the life bit, the energy, it's got to go somewhere. And since it can travel for free, it might as well go to its favourite place favourite time and place. I mean, I might go to that lake in Canada where everything was so bright and perfect and Dad was in a good mood and never asked about Mum once. I might go there and be in that day forever. I'd love it. What's to be afraid of? And Stevie, he could go up among all those winking lights and wave bands, nosying around their signals, working out what's what. It'd keep him happy for ages forever. You know what? I'm going to send him a message. I mean, why am I sitting here with everything switched off, trying to listen for something when I've never even asked him a question? I'll text him. Why not? It's got to make more sense than asking some freak with a crystal ball. A text goes right up there and bounces off a satellite. He can answer. Surely he can. Where's my mobile? 
Okay, Stevie. Why are you dead? Kiss, kiss, kiss. Lisa. Look, I don't mind waiting for an answer. I'm not daft. I'm not expecting a ghost to pop up. I'll just hang on till I hear from him. Just one reply from Stevie, that's all. It's cool. And then I'll know. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jane. I think I did say a couple of pieces, so that was my confusion. Um, but with huge delight, I'm going to invite Jim Crace onto the stage. Yet another award-winning author, and of course... Um, we offer him our congratulations for being shortlisted for the Man Booker this year for Harvest, so fingers crossed. Um, tonight, Jim is going to read from his collection of stories which weave together The Devil's Larder, which is, uh, as the name might suggest, it's an abundant and dark and sometimes erotic and disturbing collections of stories that relate to food, but much more beside. Um, Jim has been writing short stories for many, many years, um, and is, he's got a couple that he's, he tells me he's working on now as well. Um, but of course, his reputation um, has been made as a novelist. It really is an honour to, to finally meet him. Um, I was completely bowled over by being dead and quarantine. And when I was a journalist at the Sunday Times, I used to chase after him, as it were, on the phone, begging him to write pieces um, for us. So, um, Jim, um, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Crace. Hi. Yes, I'm going to read from The Devil's Larder. And as is, I guess, appropriate a festival of this kind, um, the template for this book was always another collection of short stories that I loved and adored and is always my, going to be my desert island book. And the shape of The Devil's Larder also was taken from a folk story, uh, a story which I will tell you in a minute. The book that I've always loved and still love, and I recommend it to anyone in the room who hasn't encountered it yet, is Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. And these pieces in uh, Invisible Cities, there are about 50 or 60 of them, I guess, aren't really short stories in the, in, to the extent that a story should maybe have a plot and a development, but they are fictions. And the fiction that they have is that Marco Polo is travelling to uh, visit China and he encounters all of these fantastic invisible cities on his trip there. And when he comes back to Venice, he's required to give account of these places he's seen. And it's not clear whether he's making stuff up or whether these are real cities that he's encountered. So actually, this book, even though it's a collection of short stories, has a massive unifying theme running all the way through it. It's as if every story piles and more and more of the same on the ones that have gone before. It's a deeply satisfying experience. Rush out and buy it if you can. It's thin. You know, you can read it very quickly, which I think is always a recommendation for any books these days. But I couldn't just copy Calvino. What I needed to do was to find my universal uh, uni uh, unifying theme. I'd become very interested in the way that food was playing a different role in our lives than the, the, way, the role it played when I was a kid. Well, I mean, basically, when I was a kid, uh, you would be put, have food put in front of you on the table, and you ate it, or you got a smack, and there were no other levels of guilt or complication that were associated with it. But over my lifetime, it seems our relationship with food has become so much more complicated. Um, first of all, there are all sorts of personal guilts that we associate with food, to do with uh, eating food which perhaps is bad for us, which to do with our weight, loss of weight or putting on weight. There are all the complications that foods um, are associated with uh, 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 carbon imprints and uh, relationships with countries that we don't quite approve of and, or making us eat foods that, uh, that um, we hate because they come from countries that we do approve of. Uh, the way in which food has become a social mediation, the way in which relationships are set up uh, over food. 
uh, the way in which we judge um, uh, people uh, uh, on our first dates by the way they uh, manage their spaghetti and never recommend it on a first date. So I thought that what I would do is that this would lend itself, I thought, very well to a collection, a unified collection of writing food, because what I could do would be, be to make a, a big buffet of food um, with many, many little dishes. They'd be short dishes, they'd be highly flavoured dishes, um, but uh, they would just be tasters, as it were, not stories, but they would be little works of fiction. And that this writing, of course, wouldn't be about food at all. I wouldn't be trying to give you recipes, God forbid. Don't, if you read this book, please don't attempt any of the uh, uh, recipes at home because you're going to be made very uncomfortable very quickly. No, what I was going to do was I was going to write about every subject that I could think of, but through um, the subject of food, seemingly to write about food, but really write about other things. So with the two pieces I'm going to read tonight, I won't tell you what they're about, but I hope that you're looking... Uh, in the stories for other things than uh, flavours and recipes. But the key was, that before I started on this enterprise, I needed to know how many pieces there were going to be so that to give myself a shore for, for which I could row towards to, so that I knew when I was going to finish. And there was a story, a folk story, that I'd always loved as a kid, which was about food and it was about politics. So it seemed perfect to me to use that as a template. And this is a story which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but it's a story from the Middle East which talks about uh, a great, rich, arrogant potentate riding through his land, surrounded by riches, surrounded by his retinues, surrounded by people who kowtow to him, and indifferent to the state of the people that lived in his kingdom. And of course, the people who lived in his kingdom at that time uh, was suffering from a lot of repression and especially a lot of poverty because there had been bad uh, harvests and what grain they had had been seized by the emperor. Well, the emperor is travelling through this land and one brave man decides to literally take his life in his hands and stand at the side of the retinue of the king as he passes by and shake his fist at him and says, shame, shame, look around at you, look at the poverty and the starvation, look at those children with their cavernous stomachs and their ribs, ribs showing, while you have all of the riches in the world and all of the food in the world and all of the grain in the world, everyone else suffers. So the, police, the, the king is not used to this. He says, seize that man. Off with his head. And they're just lifting the axe to take his head off. When the king has a second thought, because like all kings in, in uh, fairy tales... He's also a little bit lonely. He has no friends. He wants some company for the night. He said, wait, I have a second thought. What we will do is we will play chess tonight. And if you lose, as lose you must, off with your head. But if you win and you beat the king, huh, that's unlikely. I will grant you one wish and then off with your head because this is a realist uh, folk story. So, of course, because this is a folk story, they play chess, and the peasant beats the king. So the king is a bit amazed at this, and he says, all right, what is your one wish? And the peasant says, I want you to put one grain of wheat on the first square of the chessboard. You know this story, I'm sure. And then I want you to put two grains of wheat on the second square of the chessboard, and then four on the third, and eight on the fourth, and double up until you reach the 64th square. And the king says, huh, nothing. Two, four, six, eight, 16, 32, 64, it's nothing. Your wishes are granted, off with his head. But then, of course, as the mathematicians in this room will know, as they start adding up and adding up and adding up, what the king doesn't realise and what I didn't realise as a young boy until my math teacher told me this story was that when you get to that 64th square, you have a sum which actually is 2 to the power of 63, which in numbers, not exactly, but within a few thousand, is 18 million... What's 18 plus 18 zeros? So it's 18 million, 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 million... million 
grains of wheat. And of course, what that means is that all of the richness of the food comes from the king and goes back to the people who are starving. Now, I love this story, not only because it, for once and for a very brief moment, persuaded me that maths wasn't as boring as I'd imagined it was, but it also seemed to tell me that, first of all, that the suppressed people can succeed if they're courageous. Secondly, that the big problems of the world can be solved. But maybe most importantly in this context, that somehow or other storytelling plays its part in those solutions for the world. So there I had it. What I would do would be to write a collection of these short stories about food and politics, um, but there would be 64 of them in the naive hope that somehow or other that I would come up with a collection that was uh, 18, uh, 2 to the power of 63. We will see. The pieces I'm going to read you tonight are about uh, restaurants. And if anyone has just taken retirement and has got a... Uh, uh, nice pension that they want to spend. This is a couple of ideas for some chains that don't yet, yet exist. The first restaurant, we're going to start very dark and then end on a much lighter note. Just two new restaurants that don't quite exist yet. No one is really sure exactly where the restaurant might be. Though everyone's agreed that the walk to reach it is clandestine and punishing, but hardly beautiful. There will be hills and scooping clouds and sulfur pools to menace us. A ridge of little souffriers will belch their heavy, eggy breath across our route. Our, our eyes will run. Our chests will heave. We'll sneeze and stumble, semi-blind, with nothing but the occasional blue-marked tree trunk to guide us on our way. But still, we want to risk the walk. The restaurant's reputation is enough to get us out of bed at dawn. We have to be there by midday if we want to get back safely in the light. The five of us, five men, five strangers, united by a single appetite. We take the little taxi to where the boulder track is beaten to a halt by the river and then we wade into the water and the trees. We're wading too, of course, into the dark side of ourselves, the hungry side that knows no boundaries. The atmosphere is sexual. We're in the brothel's waiting room. The menus yet to be paraded, we do not speak, we simply wade and hike and climb. We are aroused. The restaurant is like a thousand restaurants in this part of the world, a wooden lodge with an open veranda and terraces with smoky views across the canopy towards the coast. There is a dog to greet us and voices from a radio. An off-track motorbike is leaning against a mesh of logs, but none of the 20 tables with their cane chairs, is as, yet, uh, is as yet occupied. We are, it seems, the only visitors. We stand and wait. We cough. We stamp on the veranda floor. But it is not until the Austrian, weary and impatient, claps his hands that anybody comes, a woman and a boy too young to be her son. She is well-dressed with heavy jewellery. We would have liked it better if the waiter were a man. She has bushmeats, as we'd expect, she says, some snake, which she'll kebab for us, some poacher's treats like mountain cat, and dried strips of any flesh or glands we dare to name. She has, she says, though it's expensive, parrot meat from a species that is virtually extinct. What else? To start, hors d'oeuvre, she has soft-bodied spiders, swag beetles, forest roaches, which taste, according to one of our number, 
like mushrooms with a hint of gorgonzola cheese. To drink, she offers juice or cans of beer or water flavored in some unexpected ways. But we have come, as well she knows, not for these rare dishes, but for curry number three, the menu's hottest offering, the fetish of the hill. Back in the town, if curry number two appears on menus, then it's clearly understood that mountain chicken is on offer. That's to say it's curried cuisade of frog. But we are seeking something more extreme than frog something prehistoric, hardcore, dangerous, something disallowed where we come from. We mean at last to cross the barriers of taste. So she will bring us curry number three in her good time. It isn't done to ask what she will use for meat, although the boy is eyeing us and could be bribed with cigarettes to talk. We simply have to take our chances. There might be lizard in the pot, or some unlisted insect in no book. We are prepared for monkey, rat, or dog. Offal is a possibility, a rare and testing part we've never had before, some esoteric organ stained yellow in the turmeric. Tree shark, perhaps, iguana eggs, bat meat, placenta, brain. We are bound to contemplate as well the child who went astray at the weekend, the old man who has disappeared and is not missed, or the tourist who never made it back to her hotel, the sacrificed, the stillborn, and the cadavers, the unaccounted for. And we are bound to contemplate the short fulfillment we will feel, and then the sated discontent that's bound to follow it, that's bound to come with us when we, well fed, begin descending to the coast. Not in a group, but strung out, five weary penitents, weighed down by our depravities, beset by sulfur clouds, and driven on by little more than stumbling gravity. How silent the forest is, now that our senses have been dulled by food. How careless we've become as we devour the path back to the river and the road. How tired and spent. We are fair game for any passing dogs or snakes. Those flies and wasps are free to dine on us. Those cadavers can rise up from the undergrowth and seize us by the legs if they so wish. For we are not hungry anymore. We found the path up to the restaurant, and it was punishing. So having put you off food forever, this last, this second piece uh, doesn't contain anything that will make you ill. Our strangest restaurant, the Air and Light, survived five months before its joke wore thin. We're not immune in this small town to global trends. So when the food and healthcare magazines were full of stories from Japan about a prana sect that did not eat or drink, but lived instead on atmosphere, two of our lesser artists, tired of paint and canvases, installed the front part of an empty shop with tables, chairs, and blinding lights. It was, they said, the world's first prana restaurant. Their friends dressed up as customers and waiters. There was a pompous metro d and pretty tablecloths. Orders were taken, empty glasses, empty dishes, and empty plates were delivered to the tables. Passers-by could look through the shop's front window to watch nobody eating anything. It was live art. It was, as well, the liveliest and smartest place in town. It wasn't long, of course, before outsiders, students, students mostly, came into the restaurant and filled the empty places, keen to play their part and not be fed. 
there was a queue of volunteers. What isn't clear is how the perpetrators, instead of closing down after a day or two as they had intended, began to charge for admittance to the air and light, a modest table fee at first, but then something much more complex, listed on a bill, including details of the atmosphere provided, quantities of prana consumed, and a local tax of 12%. The charges made the air and light too expensive for the students, but still the tables were packed out each night by the better off, keen to be part of the installation and at the cutting edge of food and art. They tipped quite heavily, but in a way they were not cheated. The ambiance was wonderful. The restaurateurs let buskers in to entertain the clientele. The waiters were attentive and amusing. The conversation was the most animated in town and uninterrupted by eating and drinking. The meals were meditative and purifying. And outside on the street, there was always a deep and noisy audience hustling for places near the window. If you needed to be noticed, then the air and light was the place to go. Al Pacino, in town to film The Gerda Man, was photographed being witty with an empty plate. The singer Tambar was there and sang an aria, leaning on the till. It was, according to the local radio, the coolest spot to take your girl. By the end of the month, since such is the vulgar power of modernism, determined customers had to book their tables a week in advance. It was, of course, a splendid comedy, but there were some who claimed that the restaurant, by formalising diet and restraint, was servicing a greater cause than simply a desire to be amused. The air and light combated publicly, they claimed, the countless tyrannies of food. It opened up new channels from the body to the mind. It celebrated emptiness in an otherwise oversated world. It was a bad mistake, in retrospect, to start the takeaway. <laughs> it brought the poorer students back and let the street crowd in. There was a lot of jostling between the tables. The waiters could not move around as easily. Conversations were interrupted by the general din. The restaurant soon lost its atmosphere. Such things are delicate. Besides, the lesser artists had grown rich and famous and bored with laboring till the early hours of the morning without a drop to drink. They wanted to get back to their own work. They'd have no trouble selling their undercolored paintings now. So they closed the air and light without a fuss. And all the smarter, richer people from the town were forced to take their hunger and their patronage elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, what an abundant feast. That was absolutely amazing. So um, thank you again to all our writers this evening. And if they um, wouldn't mind coming back up to the stage, we're just going to raise the lights, I hope, um, because it would be lovely to see everybody. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and we will now um, take some questions. So, um, So can you hear us okay? Okay, great. Well, um, I'm going to start this discussion, if I may, with going back to something um, that I mentioned earlier, which is um, something that I see very much in David's work, um, where the very act of writing, it seems to me, in his work is a radical act. And uh, I wondered, David, if you would comment on 
that perception um, and explain where that comes from. Um, I'm not sure that this holds water at all, but <coughs> when I feel most confident, then I think that if, as a writer of, of making of fictions and of poems, you're principally intending to make something beautiful, tell the truth, and be exact, then just in those three things, in the context in which you necessarily now operate, it is a polemical, I mean radically polemical act in an environment which we see being trashed all around us, in a zone of public discourse which is notable mostly for its evasiveness, sloppiness and mendacity, anybody actually interested in telling the truth exactly and beautifully, whatever he or she is like as a person, the act of writing itself, if it aims at those three things, is so contrary <laughs> to so much that it may be construed in that fashion. That's All right, okay. Um, I don't know if any of the panel would like to pick up on that thought and whether they were conscious in, you know, you're, you're, you mentioned, um, Jim, that, that there's a political aspect to the Devil's Larder as well. That, that in it, this, this writing about the way we perceive food uh, and our relationship with it is in its own way political. You know, I was thinking uh, uh, what a, uh, a claim of vanity that was, uh, as I said it. <laughs> when I was um, a young man, um, imagining that I could become a writer, the people that I really admired were, were the ones that went straight into politics and were unembarrassed about politics and changed the hearts and minds of anyone who read the book. And people like Orwell and Robert Tressel, you know, from local Hastings, Raggy Trouser, philanthropists, Steinbeck and those people. And I wanted to write uh, political novels as a 17-year-old that um, really would direct... They were like placards and like posters and like, um, like being at a demonstration. That's what I wanted. Then when I started to write that kind of novel, I realised that I was singing in the wrong voice. I didn't have that voice. And, uh, and I've always been aware since that time that, um, that you can't always be as political as you want to be in your writing, that sometimes it goes against the grain of the story you're telling. Mm. The important thing is to remain political in your life and to be active in your life but, and, and just let the, 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 um, the, the stories of the writing take care of themselves. What I am very aware of is my 17-year-old self would hate the bourgeois, metaphorical, rhythmic novels that I write and would have a good reason to. <laughs> well, um, Pete. Uh, I mean, to claim that... Uh, I'm not trying to suggest that all fiction should have a political undercurrent or that there should be messages. Um, but uh, do you think that... Uh, you? Does your own work come from a sense of the outside and commenting on? Uh, only because I'm in it or outside it. Do you feel in? Do you feel outside what you see? I feel out, uh, No, I do feel outside. I feel left behind uh, by the world, which is a good position probably for a writer because you observe why why that is, <laughs> and um, you know, I I wouldn't set out to have politics in the book but it's very very difficult for the book not to get infected and I end up then arguing with myself a little bit because let's say I sat down to write a spy novel uh, in the midst of everything Iraq war and eroding values and fraying society and stuff uh, so if 90% of my life is, is caught up in this vortex of, of changing realities in a way it would seem dishonest to isolate the spy novel from that and so I inevitably I let the let the doors open and um, uh, uh, let those things infect the book yeah. uh, it's just because they're they're there it's not to say that there's a there's anything correct in that but it's all I can do is to reflect uh, what I what I see yeah you mentioned when you were reading that uh, <coughs> You know you're a novelist. You don't think of yourself as a short story writer as such. No, it's difficult. It, well, Jane said something in conversation earlier which I thought was very interesting because um, Hitting Trees with Sticks is your first and only collection of short stories. And you said that you found 
writing short stories ten times more difficult than writing novels. Yeah. Uh, um, yes, could you explain why? Um, well, we probably both we probably both think the same. I mean, um, but you write short stories. Well, I, I've over a, over a writing career of longer than I care to remember. I've written one collection and I've written eight novels and loads of other stuff. Okay. Um, so I, I mean, you're I, still guilty. <laughs> oh, right, I'm guilty. <laughs> um, but I think um, short. I, I find short stories immensely difficult um, because. Oh, good <laughs> lord. <laughs> The milk, I think it might be the milking time. <laughs> um, I find short stories difficult because they have to be they have to be um, very precisely shaped. They have to they have to work to a very a, a shape that the listener or the reader can hold in their head. And a novel is a linear thing. A novel you've got you know you can keep going, you can keep going, you can keep going, and. Um, a short story is condensed and compressed and tight and tidy and um, is much more akin to poetry. And, you know, I find it's very interesting. David writes brilliant short stories. He's a poet. Well, of course he does. <laughs> He's a poet. It's, I think those... That I, th I mean, I'd be interested to see if you, if you agree with me, but I think those are much, much closer than, than, than novels and, and short stories. And for me, quite often, a short story is a thing that where I'm struggling struggling about its its shape and its form. I've got a huge number of unfinished short stories because they don't know what they they don't know what they want to be. Yeah. They they cut they aren't they're neither fish nor fowl nor a good red herring. So when I can write a story that actually holds a shape, I'm extremely pleased. But quite often it takes a lot of engineering. Yeah. Um, in a way that you do, you just don't have to do with a novel. Yeah, I mean I'm interested in what David said about truth in stories. Mm. Um, and as a journalist I've wondered uh, um, about whether it is possible to tell a greater truth in fiction than it might be in journalism. And this question is for Pierre and uh, for Jim, because Jim, you did work as a feature writer as, and as a journalist, well, mm -hmm. uh, and um, Pierre has actually written, a, wrote a brilliant piece on Armenia for the Sunday Times magazine. Um, we did a series, Authors from the Front Line, which was, um, well, authors going to places of conflict with Médecins Sans Frontières, which was a, a wonderful thing to do. Have either of you considered becoming journalists or writing more non-fiction? I was a journalist. You've been a journalist. I was a journalist for almost 20 years um, and would still have been a journalist if I hadn't <coughs> had a falling out with your ex-editor, uh, Andrew Neil, over a... Over a Political difference, because yeah. um, I, I, I'm, I have t a strange mix, I think, and I think a lot of writers have this. I'm a very puritanical sort of person, and as a journalist, I played a very straight bat, which meant because I thought that the truth, the hold a mirror to the world, and the truth is eloquent and it's progressive. So I thought all you had to do as a journalist was to go out and, and get it right, and you'd win the arguments. Um, but when I stopped being a journalist and, and started writing fiction. I, I knew that I had to do other things. I felt released. I felt that the part of me that had been repressed, which was the liar, the exaggerator, the person that always wanted to t turn something that happened into a big anecdote to make people laugh in, you know, in company, that we all do that, that that part of me was suddenly released and it had been repressed when I was a journalist. Mm. But rather than trying to locate people in a real place by holding a mirror up to a real world, I found that what I was trying to do in, in writing was to dislocate people by presenting them with an invented world. So that was the difference for me between location and dislocation. Mm. Mm -hmm. And a greater truth? Well, I don't think we should get or? too grand about it. I actually think, I actually think, when I look at the people that read my articles in the Sunday Times and the Sunday Telegraph before, I, that's where I worked before, I was their pet lefty. Um, I would see people reading the, the paper that I was in on the train, and, and I didn't know anything about those people. They could be anything. They would read my piece and they could be influenced. But when I see people reading my novels, they're just clones of me. I know what their dietary habits are, I know where they go on holiday, and I know how they vote. So really, um, and because that's the way it is, if you read one of my books and you are not from my neck of the woods politically and, such, and you know, religiously and such like, then you're not going to read the other ten. Yeah. So, so actually, I've got a constituency of readers that all share my attitudes. And so I'm, I don't feel that I'm playing a part in any debate as, as a, a novelist. 
So I, I count journalism as being much more important than writing fiction. Sorry to say so. Okay, that's I interesting. Ought, I ought to say more. What, what I mean by the truth of the, the fiction, it's, it, you've almost said it for me, it sets up a zone in which a different kind of thinking takes place. Yeah. And it's the kind of thinking which actually entertains possibilities that in practical life you are not entertaining. Yeah. It's a zone in which it is possible to be autonomous, actually enjoy a kind of the freedom of creation and to, to put things into a context. And by truth, I mean following up the truth of the project in hand. And by exactness, I mean actually making sentences which say, as closely as you, you have it in your power to say, what the developing truth of that particular project is. Now, it may seem a far leap from that to say that that activity, which is sort of enclosed within a zone in which that activity is possible, that, to me, has a sort of exemplary merit. I don't say it's going to change the world at all, but it, is, it proves that human beings are capable of disinterested thinking, thinking which is not just instrumental, and it's a zone in which they are not primarily anxious about making money or anything of that sort, and that seems to me to be intrinsically valuable. That's what poetry and fiction primarily do. And... I hold out no great hope that this is going to change the world at all, but without that, that's why it matters so much that fiction and poetry carry on. That's why it matters, I said this to you perhaps the other day, that the government should actually substantially fund the arts, and particularly perhaps literature, because literature now is the only viable extra-parliamentary opposition. If you want to know what an opposing way of being in the world a, world, a way of being in the world which is actually more connected, more humane, more interested in other people in a tolerant fashion, and, and not, as it were, parti pris, I mean, not either this ideology or that ideology, but actually entertaining, then it, it, that takes place in this zone of literature. And we've seen, you know, there are four different modes of writing. You, you That's true. Writing. Ideology has only lives there now. It's gone from government. It's gone from government, and in fact, I'll say, I shouldn't say this at all, but I, I was actually somewhere where Hunt, when Hunt was sec culture secretary, and I put that to him, and he agreed. He said, yes, when we were in opposition, we were trimming our policies to get into power. That is to say, they can, it's, it comes of office. It's by virtue of office that they necessarily think in interested ways like being shit scared what the Daily Mail is going to say about them tomorrow. So their thinking is trimmed for that. Blair's pre press secretaries candidly admitted that their job day after day after day was, if not quite to tell lies, at least to skew the truth so it would... Now, it doesn't mean that I am better a person or you are better, but you, you operate within a zone, within an office in which it is required of you to be truthful to the... Now, it's not the same sort of... It's not matter-of-fact truth, it's not journalist truth, but it seems to me intrinsically valuable that the mind should be enabled and actually encouraged to operate in that fashion. Now, I'm making yeah, no great claim it's, it's for about, this. It's about just completely engaging seriously with the world. There's, there's a fantastic little phrase that Zadie Smith wrote in an essay. She, um, she wrote, I, I write in order not to sleepwalk through my life. And that, that wake, absolutely um, mm. struck me as completely accurate mm. because it's possible, I mean, as, as you were describing, David, to, you know, to function at all sorts of superficial and evasive levels. But when you write, when you write, when you care about writing, you are, you are trying to understand something. You write in order to understand. It's an act of attempting right. to make sense. It's an act of real attention, of yeah. proper attentiveness. Attention. And exactly. most of life is actually distraction, I mean, willful distraction by media, by government, you are actually being distracted from core things that actually constitute your humanity. That happens pervasively, and we know that that's happening, and they know that they're doing it, and they know that they are suffering it as well. And writing is a zone in which you are liberated to be for the time of writing and of reading. It's vitally important that we see reading as, as the necessary co um, coexistent agent with, write, with writing itself, because writing on the page is only latently alive. It comes alive when you read. So the act of reading is, in my understanding of it, equally radical, as is the act of writing, because as you read, you are operating for a time in a sort of space which is allowed in a different fashion. And that different fashion is 
you know, I'd go so far as to say if we lose that different fashion, we really have had it. You, you all occupy various positions in terms of being, uh, you know, some of you have written plays, poetry, novels, short stories, <coughs> fiction, non-fiction. Um, to be part of this space that you, you're beautifully describing, David, do any of you think it is that we compartmentalise things a little too much? And that actually, to bring together a little like in Petit Mal, some fiction, some non-fiction, to, to bring the different disciplines together can work? Or would that be just for some writers? Or would it just be too utterly confusing? Are you con <laughs> I, I'll address it to you, Pierre. I'm, because sorry, I'm, in, the, I'm in the previous space we were talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, can bring that work? Together fi yeah. Well, the, we live in a... Listen... We live in uh, fiction and non-fiction, and we seem to manage to meld that every day. And we think such, do we believe such crap? And at the same time, there's truth going on underneath, which we disbelieve. And so, you know, just the act of living, especially in the modern day, I don't know if it was ever better or different, but particularly in our little bubble, which is, you know, where we can shit in clean drinking water. Um, you know, fiction and non-fiction are very much better, and we, we weave them without even thinking about it. And I, that's why, probably why fiction works so well for us. So I don't see a problem. Mm. And they, they certainly don't need labeling. I could write two, or any of you could write two identical stories with different outcomes, and they could both be believable whether one is true or not. I'd like to um, open this to the audience. I think I can see hands. <laughs> so um, if anybody would like to ask a question, please do put your hand up. And I think there's a roving microphone. I can't That's see That's John it. Prescott at the back there. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see any hands, actually. I don't know if... I can't see anybody. Uh, I can't see, see anybody, yeah. The hands <laughs> are fiction. <laughs> What's non-fiction is that everybody wants to go out for a cigarette and a beer and get Yeah, home. it could be. That, that could be correct, so... Still, you can play along. It's that space, you see. Fiction. Yeah, I, yeah. There's, a hand. There's one hand here. I was thinking about um, what... I think it was actually, Jane, you were talking about short stories and how difficult you found it, and trying to tell stories in a, in a neat way, was that right? I heard the word neat, and I was thinking about um, Edith Perlman and Binocular Vision, which is a collection that I'm reading at the moment and, and keep coming back to, and she seems to be like one of those kind of halcyonic writers who writes about messy things in neat ways, or, or she writes neatly about messy things, I'm not sure which, and I wondered if any of you had been reading her in any way recently, she seems to, to me, talk about the truth of things in a very neat, stroke, messy, neat way. Can you just say her name again, Rebecca? Edith Perlman. I'm sorry, I don't know, I, do, I have heard the name, but I've not read her. I, yeah, I wondered if it was, it was a question for anybody who was here, whether any of you had read her at all. If anybody can sorry. hear, um, the question was about Edith Perlman and whether any of the panel had read her. I, I'm sort of conscious of time now and the fact that I'm sure a lot of you would like to carry on the conversation um, and have some books signed and have a drink and, and possibly some people have had to disappear as well. So I'll just ask if there's any, perhaps one more question. Um, and if not, we'll carry on the conversation outside. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a measure of a very, very rich and very satisfying session that people are holding on to their questions un until we get outside. Also, I just do think it was a perfect salon um, that we heard stories, a very wide range of stories, and then it developed into a conversation, um, which is what a salon should also be about. So I'd like to thank all, I'd like to thank you very much, Kathy, for weaving it all together, and David, Pete, Jane, and Jim, thank you very much for a wonderful Soho Salon.
Okay, so, so as you've already heard, all the authors will be at the back, and if you have been holding on to some questions, um, come and ask them. Have a drink. That's the one thing maybe there hasn't been enough of in the salon. So come and have a drink and carry on the conversation. Thank <laughs> you.